Well, I didn't plan to be a little bit under the weather today, but I chose this intro before that, although it's kind of ironic. Have you ever been homesick from school? I know every uh, parent had different rules about what that would constitute. Some parents say, unless you're dying and need to go to the hospital, get to school. Others may let you off a little easier. Well, at my house growing up, if you were homesick from school, it meant you were too sick to do all the fun things that you'd rather do because you were home from school. So you were supposed to be resting and drinking water and doing some of the homework maybe that you were missing at school that day. But nobody else was home. (laughs) So... I think we can all agree that if we're in that situation, at times we do things maybe that aren't what our parents asked us to do, whether it's playing video games or watching the TV or eating unhealthy junk food that you would feel ashamed to eat in front of other people, or maybe at least in the amount that you would be afraid to eat in front of other people. But that always came with it a certain kind of fear, the fear that My parents might walk in the front door in the middle of me scarfing down that bag of Cheetos while watching a television show, because I didn't really know when they were going to be home. And so the whole day, apart from maybe the first hour after they leave, you have this nagging fear in the back of your mind, especially if you're doing the things that you're not supposed to be doing, that they're going to come back and catch you red-handed, as it were. And to put it maybe with some biblical flair, woe be to me if my parents should return and I was not found doing the things I was given to do. Well, today is the last Sunday of the church here. And so we're contemplating not the return of our parents from work on a sick day, but the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, His second promised and final return, His fulfilling return after which He will make me and everything else new, a new heavens and a new earth, paradise forevermore. If that sounds good to you, it's supposed to. The day of judgment for the Christian is actually something, as as shared with the children a moment ago, that we await with eager anticipation, for on that day true justice will be done, the joy and peace of eternal life sin and death destroyed, God Himself wiping all the tears away. That's pretty great. But any time you find yourself in a situation where you're waiting, waiting for somebody, there's a pretty natural question that comes into your mind. The question is, when? When are they going to be back? When is this person going to return? And it's the same question that we get from Jesus, or we get from meditating on the return of Jesus. We want to know when. People are obsessed with finding out when. Well, dear brothers and sisters, I have bad news for you today. No one knows. That's what our text tells us today says, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So if you get anything from today, get that if somebody tells you they know, unless they're the heavenly Father, they're lying. We don't know the answer to the question, when? And this really bothers some people because Jesus made this promise a long time ago by human standards, 2,000 years. It's a pretty long time. What's taken him so long, we might think. Or we'll read the books, uh, the writings of Paul in the New Testament, and he's always talking about how he's going to return soon, and that was a pretty long time ago too. So what are we to do with this strange sense of time? No one knows. No one knows when, not even Jesus, which is wild to think about. So what do we do with that? Well, first we have to acknowledge that it is true. We don't know. Not only the great big return of the triumphant and glorious resurrected Jesus, 
but we don't even know when our time in this life will come to an end, much less the end of all things. You could get into a car crash on the way home from church today. You could be diagnosed with a terminal illness. You could be attacked. You could be struck by lightning. You could drown. There's all kinds of ways that your life, not on your own terms and not at a time of your choosing, will come to an end. What are we supposed to do with that? That's a pretty scary position to be in. Remarkable lack of control over the outcome of our life individually, and then also corporately. I mean, we're just waiting for Jesus. And waiting can kind of suck sometimes. Well, let's jump back to the image of the child homesick from school and ask this question again. What should they do if they don't know when their parents are going to come home? Maybe this will help us think through the bigger picture question with a little more clarity. Well, our text tells us something about that too. It says, stay awake. And I will confess to you, one of my other alternative intros to my sermon was just going to be screaming that at you to see if anybody was actually asleep at the beginning. I decided not to do that. But the text says it anyway, stay awake, be on guard. In other words, you should be about the tasks which have been given to you. Jesus has the same message for His disciples in Mark 13 today, stay awake. And He's saying this because He's about to go away in two key ways. One is, right after this, Mark 14, or, uh, 14 and 15, is the betrayal, arrest, crucifixion of Jesus. So he's preparing them for some rough road ahead in the near future. Just like our text is, there's a curious chunk in the middle that as we were reading through, you might have been like, what the heck is verse 30 talking about? That this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Well, I'll teach you a new word today. There's a theological term called proleptic prophecy, which means that it's something that is talking about something in the immediate future, but also the eschatological future. Because after the death of Jesus and the scattering of His disciples to to spread the gospel, Jerusalem is destroyed by Rome and the temple raised to the ground. And if you remember from last week, that was the focus of what Jesus was telling His disciples about. That's what that middle chunk is talking about. But it's also talking about the great day of the Lord. So He's going away to the cross and to the death and grave and the empty tomb. But he also, of course, after that goes away again when he ascends into heaven and promises to return, to bring us to be with him. And we wait for his return still. So how does a Christian stay awake? How is a Christian to remain on guard while we wait for the return of our Lord? What work has God given us to do? Well, He's given us the work of faith. And that term work is a bit challenging in this context because this isn't really about a to-do list like you'd have if you were at home. But it's about a work that was done to you and for you in Jesus, a work given to you through the gift of faith. If we hop over to the reading that was read from Jude, you can see the nature of what our work is that He has left us to do. Build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord. Notice the way that is spoken. It is spoken to those who are already in the faith of Jesus, who have been given that gift of salvation through the work of Jesus, not our own work. And that we are to keep ourselves in the love of God and wait for His mercy. How do we do that? You're doing it right now. You gathered here because God has promised to meet you here in His Son. And you gathered here not because you are perfect people or more righteous than those outside of these walls, but rather because you are broken in need of healing. And this is where that healing happens. This is where those gifts 
of the new life in Christ that we can't generate on our own are given by the grace of God to you. That is the work that He has given you to do, to rely on His Son Jesus, to believe in Him and His work. It isn't about you doing a certain number of good things, although those are good, you should do them, but it's about remaining in the faith, remaining in the faith of the promises, including the promise He has made to you that He will return and that He will take you to be with Him forever. By His grace, we will be presented before the throne blameless. So we get back to the question again, so when is this going to happen? We don't know. No one knows except the Father. And since we don't know when He will return, when our time in this life is done, we rest in Christ. That is the work He has given us to do. We orient our lives around His mission, His priorities, and His work. That is what we do this morning. We rest in His most holy faith, the faith He has called us into by our baptism and by His life, death, and resurrection work, which He has done for you. So stay awake. Stay awake and have confidence that you are indeed awake, not because of any deeds of your own, but because of Christ who has awoken you. And I'll close with the words that we were heard read in Jude, for this is our certain future hope that we await with eager anticipation and total confidence in Christ. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.